Welcome. I'm here with Maria Mattarelli and Peter Stevens, Scrum Alliance certified Scrum trainers, founders of the Personal Agility Institute, and authors of Personal Agility, Six Questions to Change Your Life. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Great to be here. Great to have you. So today we are discussing how family agility helps when you have too much to do and not enough time to do it. Why this topic? Well, I think this is a classic challenge that people everywhere have. <laughs> See what you do and not enough time to do it, right? And we look to solve for that as we look at helping teams use Agile to get to market faster, to do more work in less time, more value um, with less effort. And it really does translate to your personal life as well. So what are we going to say yes to? Our prioritization is really key to what we do in Scrum for exactly that reason. Too many good things to do, not enough time to do them okay, what are we going to do with the time that we have? To not decide is also to decide, okay? And every time you say yes to a worthless feature, um, you're saying no to a feature that might have more value. So the Agile Manifesto is about developing software, but we're applying it to our everyday lives. What does it have to say about living your life? And I think it was Joe Justice who first brought the idea to my attention that, well, you could take out that developing software part and replace the software part with just about anything else and it still works. The Agile Manifesto, if, if we look at that first sentence, um, it's about um, learning, collaboration, and purpose. Okay, learning is about you know, getting better at what you're doing, inspect and adapt as we say in Scrum. Collaboration, you know, we, you know, everything in life is about collaboration and purpose gives us a reason to get up in the morning. So to say, you know, what does learning, collaboration, and purpose mean in our personal lives or our family lives? Well, you know, we still need to learn. Um, who can help is always a great question. It's one of those classic, you know, go-to questions for a coach to help you get unstuck. And why are we here? Purpose. If you become intentional about using, using that in your life, great things can happen. If we were to break down the four main values, if you look at individuals and interactions over processes and tools, like in your life, um, can you interact with people rather than go through the motions, right? Even like having a working product or output, what if we actually took action over just talking about it? So we don't have to like maybe say it word for word, like over comprehensive documentation, but hey, a lot of people talk about ideas every day. And there are brilliant ideas that people talk about every day, but not everybody acts on it. And I think that's the difference, right? And so when you look at your life and what you do, I mean, even collaboration over contracts or negotiation, right? Like even looking at responding to things that might change over sticking to the plan, Life is full of exciting curveballs. And I mean that in like a roller coaster kind of way. And you know, you, you, this concept of enjoying the journey. And boy, has my roller coaster been like, woo, lately. And you know, when you when you look at that, there's unexpected things everywhere. So if we can be prepared to respond to change, if we can connect with people, if we can focus on actions and output over just talking about stuff or right, right, just like thinking about it. And if we can collaborate with people rather than trying to get every little detail right and micromanage or nitpick things, I mean, I think you might have a better life, right? That you, you don't do some of these other things, right? You just say you value people and interactions and taking action more. And just knowing that life will have curveballs and we have these techniques that work so well in business that we can apply to our life to do more of what really matters. So we're talking about it a little bit already, but what are the similarities between developing a product and leading your life and what's different? This was actually kind of one of my first questions when I started applying Scrum to my life because you know we talked about, well, who's gonna be my Scrum master? Who's gonna be my product? Wait a minute, can I really be all three roles at once? This, this, this seems kind of like not, not recommended. Um, and my, my first observation was I'm not very good at being my own scrum master, okay? It's really difficult to tell yourself to stop, step back, take a look at the big, take a look at the big picture. And that's really where, where the, the, what we call the celebration coach, where that derived from. And, and it was the first and most obvious way to say, well, you know, it's really, it's really useful to get help from someone else. So this is why we do scrum. It's because you, you need to inspect and adapt. How many of the plans that we made back in January are still you know, still relevant today. I mean, just things can change quite, quite dramatically. Okay. So I think there's a lot of similarity in the, in the complexity and the need to inspect and adapt um, the way we see that in product development. Where I think things are different is the question of, you know, whose, whose boat is it actually? You know, in Scrum, 
you're usually building a product for someone else, you know, maybe directly in the sense that you have a client and that person is, you know, you know, that, that client tells you what, what it is you're supposed to build, or, you know, you're a self-managing scrum team where you're trying to figure out what to build, but it's still mostly driven by, you know, people outside the team, you know, what's, what's the right thing to do or not for your own life. Hey, it's your boat. You get to decide where it goes. And if you want to change the destination midway through the week, it's your boat. You get to do that. You are the product owner of your life, um, you know, if we're going to use Scrum terminology. And so you get to make these decisions. That, that is often very scary for people when they first hear it. What do you mean it's my boat? What do you mean I get to decide? Well, if it's not you who's deciding, who's going to decide? You know, but then they say, wow, it's my boat. Wow, I get to decide. I get to choose. Okay, and all of a sudden that's very empowering, but you, you get the, these dramatic changes in, in direction in people's lives as they realize that they actually do have their hand on the rudder. And well, yeah, there are winds and other forces out there that they can't control. And sometimes those winds, you know, you get into a heavy storm, sometimes those winds are pretty strong, but it's still their boat, okay? You're not just self-managing for your life, you're self-directing for your life. You get to set the course of your life, okay? And so I, th I think that that's an important difference to, um, uh, you know, to the context that we normally see in product development. Absolutely. And let's dig into that a little bit. So you have a family, a couple few yeah. adults, maybe some kids, each one, mm -hmm. if they are personally agile, sets themselves up as their own product owner, perhaps they're each other's accountability partner or celebration mm -hmm. partner, perhaps they're not, and they've got other folks who are cheering them on from the mm -hmm. sidelines. How does that personal agility then help families come together, prioritize, and align, especially if they have maybe some competing priorities in their lives? I'm going back, you know, I, I created personal agility, I, or the first iterations of personal agility. And at some point, I asked my wife if she would, you know, be my uh, celebration partner, and she agreed to do that. And then I asked if we could reverse the roles. Would she like you know, me to be her celebration partner for her personal agility? And she said, no, she didn't want to do that. She didn't want to go there. <laughs> and that, that was actually where I kind of realized what this coaching stand stuff was all about because I had to accept that, okay? And you know, it's like one of the first things in coaching is you, know, you ask for permission to coach and if you don't get permission, then you can't do it. Um, and it's interesting, like when you're working with teenagers, you know, teenagers, they go through a phase where they are, really not interested in being coached. They are establishing themselves as their own person. You can't force anybody to do anything here. But what you do have is control over yourself. Much, much later, I invited my wife to actually take the personal agility workshop with me. And she says, mm, yeah, mm, yeah, okay. And, and she was really apprehensive before the, before the class started. But then once we got going, it was like, oh, wow, this is great. Okay, and, and oh, wow. And, and now she sees how it connects her to the things that make her happy. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's, you can invite someone, you know, and when they go through the door, they go through the door and that's wonderful. And when they don't, that's okay too. So, you know, I think, you know, a family is not a regiment. They're not all following, you know, the marching orders from, you know, if, if we like go to the Von Trapp family from the sound of music, you know, this is, this is not what families are, <laughs> or Von Trapp's vision of what his family was. This is, this is not how families work. Um, you know, there are a bunch of individuals um, the children are dependent on their parents, probably more dependent than they realize, but also more independent than they realize. And they're growing up so that, you know, the parents are, um, you know, helping their kids become fully functioning adults if they're, if they're good parents. And, um, you know, so each one that there's kind of this personal vision of who, would, who do I want to be? Um, and then there's this kind of collective vision of who are we together as a family? And I'm not sure how much you need to put the who is the family in the foreground. Um, you know, I, I think that's one of the things that's going to depend on, you know, every family is going to be a bit different, is, is going to find their own path and their own solution. Um, you know, for me, you know, each, each of our, each member of my family has their own vision, who they want to become. And that's what's really great. You know, both of my kids have found purpose in the last year and they've, you know, they, they've just grown up tremendously. I mean, maybe the, maybe the COVID crisis caused it, or maybe it would have happened anyway. I don't know, but you know, they're both, I think in a much better place than they were even, you know, six months or a year ago. Your life is something you live. And if we're trying mm -hmm. to figure out how do we prioritize within a family, especially with competing priorities, well, it starts with do we know what matters? Are we conscious of what we're doing? Or are we running on like mm -hmm. our own cycles and patterns in like a haphazard fashion? Or are we in alignment and in harmony? 
And so I think that that's something that when we talk about the concept of personal agility, that really brings to the table in your home life is even just for, for people around you or friends, right? I, I was just thinking earlier today, like, is life a team sport? And one of my friends, Karen, she said, yeah, it's the top, the, the top five people that you're around the most are who have the biggest impact on your life, right? And so if you have a mm-hmm. family, I mean, you're probably around them the most. So are you in alignment? Are you in harmony? And I think that's, that's like the start of that conversation. Let's talk a little yep. bit about that. The getting into alignment, finding harmony. I know you have an exercise within personal agility, the priorities map. Mm-hmm. For a family, what does that look like? Is it each person coming to, ta- to the table with their individual priorities and values? Or is it something that can be done together as well? I think it could be done one of two ways. You could either have each individual with their own priorities map. So let's say Peter has his priorities map, his wife mm-hmm. has hers. And let's say one day his teenagers decide they want to you know, experiment with this as well, right? Mm-hmm. That could be super valuable just for them to be able to share, right? Like we look at Agile, like a big theme is making things visible, having transparency mm-hmm. and openness, right? And so if Peter's just saying, hey, here's my priorities map. I just want you all to know, here's what's important to me. Here's what really matters. And here's what I'm, I'm working on. Uh, they can see each other's priorities maps and what's important to them. Now, the idea of a combined board is actually our first attempt at doing a combined priorities map with multiple people was one of the most largest raging successes of the last couple of years. And the reason I say this is because, now this wasn't within a family, but it's the same concept of having a shared board. And so Sharon, who is one of my dear friends, uh, she's someone who is one of the first personal agility practitioners that really had a profound change in her life. And you know, it's so funny, when I met her a couple of years ago, she's like, hey Maria, like, I, I want these things in my life. I'm like, well, why don't you just do them? And she's like, well, but, but, but I don't know how. And I'm like, I'll help you, all right? And I realized that just like, you know, when she was sharing what was important to her, what really mattered, I started teaching her personal agility without really calling it that, right? I was just like, hey, do this, Mr. Miyake, wax on, wax off, right? And then I showed her the personal agility <laughs> system and she was using that. And you know, she took the top three to four things that really mattered to her. She actually put them on post-it notes in her car on her dashboard. She drove a lot. And so she's like, hey, I look at what really matters to me every day. Now, fast forward one year. One of the things that was important to Sharon was uh, health and fitness. Um, Her mother had passed away, had some health complications that probably didn't help. And she was over 300 pounds. Uh, Her dream was to become a private chef and caterer. And yet she was working five jobs and barely getting by. And so she's doing all this stuff. She was driving for Uber. That's how I met her. I got into the back of her Uber one day. And she was (laughs) telling me that her dream was to have her own TV cooking show. Like, well, why don't you just put it on YouTube and like build a portfolio? And she's like, I don't know how to use YouTube. I'm like, I do. Can I eat the food for free if you come cook it at my kitchen, right? And so there, <laughs> that's how our, our friendship began. And so, and as we're going through this year, like she's focused on business, but she'd do an event and she couldn't even get out of bed the next day because her health just was not there. Interestingly enough, I could relate to this a lot because my health had a big slip four years ago. And I had a similar challenge where, man, I could not, if, if I tried to do a training class for even two days, like I couldn't get out of bed the next day because my health was so challenged from how much, I, I mean, just so much wear and tear, you know, traveling and, and all of these things. And you know, talking to Sharon, we both looked at our priorities map after that year. And we realized we did not get anywhere close to our health and fitness goals that we had said were important, right? We say we want to get in the best shape of our lives, but nothing in our actions like aligns or <laughs> only aligns for like a day or two. So Sharon actually came up with the idea. She reached out to me one day. She's like, hey, Marie, I created a priorities map for you, me, and our friend Jen to be on together. And I tell you what happened after that was magic. Because we had a shared priorities map and we said, what really matters to us? Why are we doing this? We had clarity around what was important, right? And so Sharon, she is well under 300 pounds now. She's actually at 54 pounds down today. I have wow. been down about 15 pounds and Jen's down, I think 20, 25 pounds. And so when you look at that, boy, am I glad that we did that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, when you look at it, um, having that accountability, having that shared vision, using the priorities map for a group of people, we found that be, to be very successful. And I think the next step is to have a family try it, right? Like let's run some experiments and imagine if you as a family Imagine if as parents, you'd listen to your kids and what was important to them. Imagine if your teenagers actually thought that you cared and understood them. Could we create visibility 
into what really matters and actually listen rather than telling them what to do and what not to do. What, I'm curious what that outcome could be. So I think whether you have individuals that all have their own priorities map and they share, you can see what's important to each other, that's one way. And the shared priorities map that we've done was an absolute success. And I think that would be incredible for a family. So let's talk about it. How do Agilists leverage that clarity, leverage that alignment to increase autonomy and accountability within an, a partnership, within a family, and overall in their lives? And accountability is a big word in classical management, okay? And even to this day, it's still a big word in Scrum, okay? You know, you're, you, know you get to the end of the sprint review and you're kind of expected to have delivered, you know, I, I'm not sure if this is exactly the way the Scrum Guide sees it, but the way a lot of teams actually practice it, you get to the end of the sprint, you're supposed to have delivered pretty much what you said you were going to do at the beginning of the sprint. And if not, there's, you know, some, some you know, potentially unpleasant discussions to happen at the end of the sprint. Now, obviously, none of us recommend actually doing these unpleasant discussions that way. But, you know, this, this, you look at what's, what's happening out there in the real world. And, um, personal agility really is not about, I, I don't like the word accountability because it's got this blame. Okay. And for me, personal agility is about celebrating what you get done. You know, celebrating the things that, that, that are working. Okay. You know, and, and it's, it's really, it, it, it sounds... It might seem a bit trite, but it's actually about focusing on the positive. And the, the underlying assumption here is that we're all confronted with life. We're confronted with the challenges of life. You know, yes, you said you were going to get this chapter in your book written, but, you know, your son had a bike accident and needed um, much more attention than you thought this week. Are you going to tell your son, sorry, I got to write my book when he says, mommy, I, my, my knee is bleeding. And, and I'm, I, it's kind of at a funny angle here. Uh, no, it's, it's not going to happen. OK, it's just, it just isn't. You know, the, the, you know, life, life, life happens. And so the idea is, you know, we're making decisions every day about how to use our time. OK, and what really matters helps us make good decisions even though life is so complex and unpredictable, when you develop this, this, this concept of, of what really matters and have a common understanding about what you care about. So, you know, like what are the, what are the things that you care about? Um, you know, maybe you care about happiness. Maybe you've got a degree that you're working to or your book that you're trying to write or your startup that you're trying to get going. And, you know, well, yes, you've also got your other obligations, you know, like your family and your kids, you know, and just being aware of what it is that you're trying to balance, okay? Um, you know, just, just having this common understanding can be hugely helpful because you have understanding of what the other prob what the other person is going through. And when they don't do what's expected, you know, you, you can um, cut them some slack, show them some kindness, show, you know, show them some understanding, ask, you know, offer help, you know, as opposed to, you know, being demanding about what you didn't do. So, you know, it's in, in, in English, we use accountability as, as kind of a, well, someone to check that you're really doing it, but it, but it's got this strong, the this, this strong thing of blame. And if you assume that everyone's trying to do a good job, then, you know, then it's a, um, um, you know, then there's no need for blame. And, you know, for me, agility is, is we, we, instead of having command and control, you know, we have trust, transparency, and fast feedback. Okay. And inspect and adapt. And, and that's, that's what keeps us, keeps us moving forward without the need for all of this, this blame stuff. So, is it really possible for families, especially large families with school-aged children during a pandemic to share a vision? I think it's more important than ever before in this situation for a family to share a vision uh, because the vision is really that North Star that you always go back to that helps you stay on track and remember what you're trying to do. So when we look at conflict or the possibility of conflict happening, if you don't have a clear vision, I think it's more likely for that to occur. I'm trying to think, what does it mean for a family to have a vision? And what, one thing I've come to believe is that who are we is a really powerful question um, in, a lot of, in a lot of different contexts. You know, and so the idea that we as a family have a vision of who we are or that we as a couple you know, have a vision of who we are, um, you know, and that kind of gives you something to orient on when things are difficult. Um, you know, that seems to me to be like an interesting question. Um, maybe what's special about us? That's also kind of an interesting question, okay? And kind of you start to remember, I, somewhere I heard that, you know, one sign of a good couple is they're always saying, we're not like other couples. We have this so much better than everyone else, you know? And so I think that's, that's kind of this feeling of uniqueness and specialness. So yeah, I think families have a vision uh, and a sense of identity. So 
sharing a vision, you were talking about how it's more important now than ever, Maria. What agile or scrum techniques can help families overcome obstacles and stay on track? Such a good question. And I think this really goes back to the core agile concepts of making things visible and then surfacing impediments. And so if we aren't aware, number one, if we're not aware of what the problems are, we can't fix them, right? So if it's not visible, if we, especially if you have a larger family or there's more likeliness that you'll be off track or on different pages, um, that's one of the things where if we're not even aware, we're not all talking on the same page. But I'd like to do like a throwback. I was watching uh, a TV episode not too long ago about, you know, one of those perfect families on television, right? And then you can insert fill in the blank with any sitcom. And it's like, what happens? Like always there's a miscommunication that then turns into a thing, which is the whole point of having an episode. And you're just sitting there and you're like, if only they would just talk to each other. And you know, have you ever thought that? And you're, you're watching this huge drama unfold on like in this TV show. And you're just like, man, this is a great family. Like these, these kids have a loving home and yet they're misunderstood. There's miscommunication. Where did that happen? And usually what happens is it's just a misunderstanding or miscommunication. And I think that, you know, this is one of the concepts that personal agility helps us with is to say, what really matters? And if we know, and if we're in alignment, and if we feel, especially as children, that we can be safe and talk to our parents about stuff, that's where usually the problem comes in is at some point, I think either trust is broken. I'm sure psychologists have, have microanalyzed teenagers, right? But if you look at it, at what point do, can we not have that transparency? Do we not have that trust? to where we can lean on each other. So, you know, that's one of the things with the Celebrate and Choose events and that weekly celebration that to do is like, hey, how are we doing as a family? How are we like connecting? What, what could be better? I mean, really it's a retrospective at its deepest form. Can you speak a little bit about the transparency and trust that's pretty paramount to this community? I mean, I can, I can speak to that. I mean, one classic problem that a lot of parents have is, do I want to be firm with my kids or do I want to be loving with my kids? As if these things are somehow opposites, okay? Now, it, it, it turns out they're not opposites, okay? You know, you can be loving or you can be harsh. You can be firm or you can be um, unpredictable, okay? And, you know, kids do need safety, Okay, you know, safety, you know, and, and rules are part of that safety because, you know, the rules, they know what to expect, they know how to act, you know, all, all of these things give them context and, and make it possible for them to, you know, to grow. Um, but rules doesn't mean you've got somebody, you know, holding a stick and threatening them with punishment for not, you know, if they, if they don't do it, you know, quite the opposite. Uh, one of the authors that was quite influential to me was a guy named uh, Stephen Bidolf, who's an Australian, and he talked about this concept of, of what he called firm love which is you can be firm and you can be loving. And, you know, it's all about creating safety. And so, you know, we see the same topics coming up over and over again. You know, the kids need it. You know, your teammates need it. Um, the, the couple, you know, the couple in the family, they, they need it as well. Um, so that you can talk about difficult concept, uh, difficult uh, topics. If you don't have safety, then it's difficult to top, talk about things. I've also noticed even in relationships, so we, we mentioned with children, right, and creating that safety, but even within relationships, like, do we understand and believe that our partner has the best intentions? Can we assume that they're just doing their best going through life? Or, you know, when conflict comes up, is it, oh, how could you? Oh, how dare you? Oh, you're living your life the way you want. Oh, how could you? I'm in your life, right? And so how can we create that alignment proactively rather than waiting until it becomes a problem. And I think that if that conversation can happen ahead of time on what really matters and what's important, that can set the right tone and a tone for assuming best intent, right? Things like that. Absolutely. You know, I, think, I think the part about, you know, assuming good intention on the part of your partner, I think that's really huge. You know, I was thinking, you know, every good soap opera starts out with, first of all, some sort of missing communication where the partners didn't understand each other. And then they make all kinds of wild and crazy assumptions about what the other person was doing, you know, which leads them into this downward spiral, which, spiral, which makes for good drama, but, you know, kind of a difficult relationship. Um, you know, and I, I think that that, um, uh, you know, this, 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 and sometimes it's even helpful to remind each other, hey, you know, everyone here has good intentions. Everyone's doing the best, doing their best even if we're under a lot of stress, even if we have this situation or that situation. And, you know, that can be really helpful. 
it works with children and with adults, with the kiddos, it's buddy, I know you tried your best. And with my partner, it's, I know your intentions here are totally in line with what we'd agreed on. It's okay. You don't have to defend yourself. I trust where you're coming from. And just speaking those words partner kind of tones the situation down a bit and allows the conversation to move forward even if somebody you know came in defensive or came in concerned about someone else's reaction which inevitably happens in relationships because you're not always confident in your communication and you're not always confident about communicating those words sounded so comforting can we script those out like i know you had the <laughs> cue cards at home agility cue cards i know you had the best intent like to diffuse anything i love that you know, cue cards are not the worst idea with uh, the youngest one when we were first working on some of our, our parenting solutions for him because he's a big emotions kid and he's really in his head. It was that we would put little cue cards for ourselves up on the wall to remind ourselves what we'd agreed to say when they were just spinning out. Mm -hmm. And it helped us stay in line with the vision that we shared for them. Yeah. One thing which, which was really helpful for me uh, or for me and my wife as our kids were growing up is my wife and I made working agreements about how we're going to act and how we're going to behave you know, with the kids. And we didn't use that fancy term working agreements, but you know, we did this, you know, one of the things that um, uh, we did agree on is that um, you know, we're not gonna let the kids play us off against each other. That is, they can't go to me, I say no, they go to mom and mom says yes, you know, because that, you know, it's, it's, you know, you can't, you know, you can't have one parent be able to override the decisions of the other without them at least syncing up with each other on, on what's the right thing to do. Um, you know, and I think that that, you know, that, that, you know, these, these things, first of all, you know, working agreements are about creating common sense. Okay, so we're creating the common and common sense. And, and so, you know, if, if the parents kind of form their working agreements, and obviously, if you make agreements, you have to stick to them. You know, and, uh, you know, if you've got a stay at home mom and a traveling dad, that can be a bit difficult, because, you know, the, the physical presence and being together actually, you know, makes these agreements, you um, it makes it has you live the agreements if one person's away a lot and then only shows up you know in, in the house for you know two weeks at a time every every two weeks well what happened to those agreements while you weren't there and so there's a lot of renegotiating that happens when, when you come back um i think this might be a scrum trainer problem but uh it might be an executive problem as well but you know so these these agree these working agreements and you know what agreements do you make and how do you maintain them in the face of the turbulence of you know, of life, especially in a high travel world. Now, traveling isn't our problem these days. So, you know, we got other problems, but, um, you know, all of these things, they, they can make your life easier. And when, and when you start seeing that you're having problems, a working agreement can be a good way to fix the problem, okay? You know, that's kind of, oh, we got a problem. How, you know, what can we do differently to fix it? Everyone has good intent. Okay, let's agree to do it this way. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think just the traveling parent, um, is the only case in which this applies. I think every parent and partnership really in which you're managing a household or a pet, it, it applies because somebody is gonna be the primary who's doing most of the day-to-day -day whatever at any given time. And then the other person is the one who's who's the support parent, you know, maybe who's working more hours or who doesn't walk the dog as much, but make sure that the dog gets to the vet or whatever the case may be. And having those working agreements allows the person who's not there to trust the person who is there and vice versa. For that person who's there doing the day-to-day -to, -day, to trust that, that that other person knows they know what they're doing and that they're in alignment and that they can act and make decisions in the moment, just like your scrum team. You want them to have that product owner vision so that they always know where their Jamaica is, where they're headed. It's, uh, it's played out a lot in our house. Yeah. And, you know, and we find that these, you know, core values of, you know, respect, you know, speak, you know, both how you speak to each other, uh, but also how you speak about the other person, especially when the other person isn't there. Um, you know, these are, you know, having, having a positive spin on how you talk to each other and how you talk about each other is, is, is actually, this is, this is one of those things where, you know, that might not get you invited to parties when you start seeing through this, because, you know, th th there are couples who are generally, you know, respectful and treat each other well, and you say, man, these guys are going to be together for a long time. And you see other couples that aren't doing that. And you say, man, what's keeping the two together? What recommendations would you make to families when they discover the right thing they've been pursuing maybe isn't right for right now anymore? This reminds me of our, our metaphor when we look at the, um, 
just you're on the captain of your ship and you're heading toward Jamaica, right? And one of the things that Peter and I always talk about is that personal agility is a very kind framework. It's it's not a scolding, ah, ah, you didn't get that done. It's, wait a minute, we're a little off course. The best thing to do when you're off course is to notice that you're off course and simply look at getting on course. And this reminds me of trying to find a place with maybe shoddy directions. Um, how do people react when you like, you're, you're lost when you're driving, right? This is like a good test of like the type of person in a challenging situation. So I remember, uh, years ago, being in a car with uh, someone that I was dating at the time. And um, we were like, missed an exit. We're dri driving somewhere, we missed it. And oh my gosh, da 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 like, like panic, freaking out, like, ah, we missed the exit. Now we gotta go around here and over there. And this is before you really had GPS. So, I mean, we didn't have our phones telling us exactly where to go. And it's just like, ah, ah, right? And you're like, oh my gosh, like this is, this is conflict. And then they get ruins the other person's night and they're getting angry. They're like, you're supposed to turn. What this, that, the other, right? And then I remember um, one time I was in the car with a friend and we were trying to find a concert. It's like just a small concert venue and we could not find it to save our lives. We were driving around and around and around and around. And I remember thinking, oh man, is he going to get mad that we're lost? But he was so like cool as a cucumber, just like, oh, well, that's not it. Hmm, let's see, right? So the question is, when conflict happens, when something goes wrong, what is your reaction? Is it to panic and freak out? Or is it to say, what's the next best thing that we can do? So if we are out of alignment or if we're not, the thing that we thought was the right thing that we've been pursuing isn't the right thing, and maybe it was from external factors, maybe something changed internally in our family or in our context, we need to do something different. Like, so how do we respond to that? Is it, oh my gosh, we've been off, we're wasting so much time. How could you have let us do this, right? Or is it, oh, so we're not doing that anymore. What should we do, right? Like, what's the next thing? And, you know, if you, if you use that second approach, you'll probably get compliments all the time. Like people are like, oh, oh, okay. So you're not mad, but what would that do? How would that help? What's the next set of actions that we should have? What is the next right thing? And let's not like get emotions all like upset for no reason. That doesn't actually help us get to the right thing. And so there's something here about conscious communication and like nonviolent communication that I think can come in that can help us get back on the right course. And I'm wondering also if personal agility isn't a bit of a path to trusting yourself as well in uncertain circumstances. You know, I, th I think that's a really important point because, you know, one of the things, you know, we, we've talked about the, you know, life is the ocean, you're the captain of the boat and you're not just the captain of the boat, it's your boat, okay? You get to decide where it goes. Um, and, and so this is like, if you decide, well, you've been sailing to Jamaica and you decide you actually want to go to Cuba or Cayman Island or set source, set sail for Antarctica, you know, it's your boat, you get to do that. And what's interesting is if you will, um, what, what, what does Jamaica represent here? Well, the deepest question is always, why am I doing this? Why am I doing personal agility? What's the change in myself that I wanna make happen? Or you know, if I already am the person that I wanna be, what is the state in myself that I wanna maintain in this balance? So, you, know, you, get these, you get some orientation, okay? And, and then from that, you, you start to think about, well, in order to achieve this goal or maintain this, this, the state of who I am, what really matters? Okay, and so you get like three or four things, and these are constants in your life, um, or let's say relative constants in your life. It's not that they're never going to change, but they don't change very often. But but you look to these things for orientation when you're deciding how to spend your time, um, you know, who to spend it with, um, you know, what's you know what you want to be doing because your your time is the most valuable thing that you have. Okay, with the possible exception of your health, you only get to use it once. Okay, and, and you know, health when you're young, you say, well, I get sick, I'll get better, that's true. But you know, as you get older, you start to realize that, well, you don't always get better. And some people get sick and they, they you know, so you know, your, your health is also quite valuable. But basically what really matters, when you decide to spend your time, you're also saying that whatever thing that is, that really matters and whatever thing you're not spending your time on doesn't matter. So you're always making these decisions. And then how you choose to spend your time, um, this is an indication as to what you think is important. 
And so now you've got these guideposts, which we call what really matters, and then you've got how you're spending your time. And if you discover that the situation is different and those things don't matter anymore, or things that you should you think should matter, but you're not spending time on them, this gives you the moment to say, oh, wait a minute, there's something out of balance here, okay? And then and you say, well, what do I wanna do differently? Okay, and if we're talking about a major course change, I wanna do this instead of that. Um, I don't want to study computer science. I want to go off and be a bartender. You know, that's kind of a major, that's a major change in direction. But there's something there that, you know, that really matters, which wasn't getting attention before, which you're giving attention to now. You're bringing yourself into harmony with, with who you want to be. Now, what's interesting about having what really matters kind of in this first column is it's really easy to communicate it when it changes. And it's really easy to help other people understand, you know, what's, what's happening. Okay, and surprisingly, it's also easy, easier to help your partner because you can ask them, how have you been spending your time? Oh, there is this item, um, <clears throat> you know, maybe it's, it's um, you know, fun and happiness, maybe it's order and security in your life, maybe it's a challenging new career, you know, you're not doing much about that, you know, do you still care about that? Do you want to be doing more on it? So it becomes easier to talk about these things. You know, as Agilists, we don't not only know what we're doing, we know why we're doing it. Okay, and if, if what we're doing somehow isn't in alignment with that deeper why, we can recognize that and that makes it possible for us to change class, change course. Uh, in my case, I've changed my what really matters column maybe once every 15 months or so. So I've realized that there's something that's out of balance and I need to do something differently and that I can have a conversation about that and communicate it and people start orienting themselves around it fairly quickly. That's amazing. Maria, how often do you think you change your what, re what really matters? Yeah, I've changed it. So when I met Peter in Munich, Germany, we connected and we started talking about this about four years ago, four or five years ago. I remember that what I had thought that mattered, all those things actually didn't matter at all. And so whatever, the, the way that I had been living my life was according to a certain reality, right? I had a breadcrumb trail, whether I knew it or not. Like, these are the things I do. These were the larger categories. And I remember listing out Peter just asked me what really matters. And I was like, <gasps> like, and I was just like floored. It was like that scene in a movie where I was like, by golly, I think nothing that I thought, <laughs> right? And so like one of the things I noticed was that health was not even on my radar. And that was the thing that was 100% most important. And so when I first had this conversation with Peter around personal agility, I realized that I needed to shift what really mattered. Now, over the years, I think I made one change. So maybe once every two, two and a half years. So like what really matters shouldn't change too often. Um, and I think I only tweaked one item. I, I removed one or I, I changed one item and then I like added a fourth. And so it's one of those things where um, usually it's not, it's like if you take Myers-Briggs, right? It's most likely gonna be pretty similar throughout your life. Now, if you have a big life change or you get married or you move and have a different job, there's different things that could maybe alter, maybe alter the outcome of that. Um, if you did that same assessment again, and similar to personal agility, like we don't expect what really matters to be changing all the time. And if it does, that might tell you something. And so it's usually related to like a life event. Like even talking with Lisa Atkins, I remember she said with the pandemic, she changed what really matters mm -hmm. because her entire world and environment had shifted. And she's like, I need to rethink all this. So I think what we're seeing is maybe like an average of like one and a half to two years ish. And so when you think about that, maybe there's like a natural rhythm in how we live and like, when does something get stale, right? Or when does something need a refresher? And like, for me, I remember like going on site with a company to consult. It's usually like the first six months, you might not really know what's going on. They might be like tiptoeing around. After six months to a year, you're comfortable, you're confident, you're not as hesitant, you know people there, you understand a little bit more of the culture, right? And so I think there's something like that where maybe every one to two years, you start to reevaluate and say, hey, where am I? And on this path to Jamaica, am I still on course? Is that still where I want to go? Um, but also it can um, depend on what's happening in your life. When I look at the people who are doing well now, uh, I think that I see that as a recurring pattern. They have a sense of purpose, a sense of direction. Uh, they know where they're going and why they want to go there. Um, and, you know, whether they're doing personal agility or not, it's, it's not about personal agility per se. It's about this, this, this sense of purpose. And you know, if you got a sense of purpose, then you can weather, you know, then you can weather the storm. It's when you don't have any sense of direction, then you start to notice all the waves that are tossing the boat around.
Yeah, so this is this is one of the those opportunities in life where you have the opportunity to choose how you respond to external factors, right? And so, as you know, 90% of what we do is in-person on-site training. And I was flying all over the world doing that. And when the pandemic hit, I realized it was an opportunity to make a shift. And, you know, even it's, if something happens, the glass half full or half empty, right? And is it's kind of what you make of it. And so when the entire world is literally flipped upside down, what do you choose to do with that? And there are people that chose to watch the news and to fall into a, you know, a downward spiral with that and like panic and confusion and right. And like letting that be their inputs. And I thought, well, okay, this, what could the opportunity be? So my first initiative is everyone was complaining about, oh, how is anything going to work virtually? I'm saying, well, how can it work virtually? Let me look at how it can work virtually. And so immediately uh, pivoting to, to shift all of our training classes to be online live instructor led, and then looking at launching marketing campaigns to, to do that, to promote them. And it's like, I saw more opportunity and I looked for what's the benefit of this, right? So like how many more people can we reach by working virtual? Now that companies are more accustomed to stuff being virtual, how much easier it is to reach other, other markets to, to create a positive message in the world. Like what we do is help people work better and live better. Like this is an opportunity to reach more, right? And so I, I think that for me, I mean, yes. And, and you know what, what was really pivotal for me, um, I actually see that I could have fallen into a little bit of a downward spiral and depression myself, you know, uh, living alone, pandemic, lots of uncertainty. And a good friend of mine I actually uh, started working with. And so Mark, Mark and I started working together and having that other person to pair with in converting the training to being online, to co-facilitating this work in this virtual environment where you got 30 people in the room and you're like, ah, what do I do, right? Like technology doesn't always work. And so I think the biggest change for me was having someone at my side that we were in alignment and I didn't feel alone. And I 100% believe that I was so much more productive just by having someone else that was in alignment with me that was helping me move forward toward what we we're trying to do. And so I'm very, very grateful for that because without that, I, I wonder if I would have been as productive. And I think the answer is ob an obviously like hard no. <laughs> like, <laughs> no. And so this gets back to the whole concept of family and the concept of your partner. If you are not alone in this world and you have someone to pair with, like we, we know pair programming is effective, right? So like, can you do that in life? And isn't that what couples are about, right? This is your partner in life, so you're not alone. And so it's so important to be in alignment and have clear communication. So yeah, I think it's the opportunity. It's our opportunity. Hey, we got blown off course. Do we wanna stop by the Cayman Islands or do we wanna get back on track to Jamaica, right? Like you get to choose that. Or do you wanna drift off to sea and complain about it? That's an option too. You can choose that. As many will. <laughs> I'm loving this direction we've taken this. And now the big question is, if you were to teach a class uh, to families, on retrospectives, on sprint planning, on personal agility, what would the three biggest takeaways be? I think if there were three big takeaways, but then you limit us to three. I think the first one would be, and, and Peter just said it, it's the clarity of purpose. It's having that clarity because without that North Star, what else are we even trying to do? And that's one of the things I love about the priorities map and personal agility is that you can very clearly, visibly see these are the things that matter and we can color code them at a glance. You look at your priorities map, you look at your breadcrumb trail, you can see are the things that I said that mattered the things that I'm doing. So first of all, having that clarity in the first place is essential. I believe that communication. So having the safety where each person there feels like they can say, here's what's going on and here's what I think and here's how I feel. So without people feeling comfortable communicating, it's not gonna work, right? Like it can sort of kind of work, but you're gonna have dysfunction. And then I think the third most important thing is appreciation. And we see this all the time. And I've had some quite dysfunctional teams over the years. And uh, you know, sometimes we're just off on different pages. And when we take the time to do appreciations at the end of a retrospective, I had a team where we got to a point where we were having to do appreciations at the end of every daily scrum because it was that bad. And there was that much, yeah, you laughed, but it was painful. Like, it was like so <laughs> challenging. You're like, ha, 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 oh, I can only imagine such a day. And, you know, so we were literally at the end of every day having people say, okay, here's what I appreciate about you. Here's what I appreciate about you to each person. 
And what that did, that alone, just adding an appreciation to the end of the daily scrum, it, it flipped it. It flipped. People are like, oh, oh, this guy's not trying to make my job hard. He's just really busy and feeling overwhelmed. Got it. Right. And so it's back to the assuming best intent. I'm noticing some common themes here as we talk. Right. So I think you have to have clarity first and foremost. Are we even working on the right things to begin with? And then having that communication open to where, I mean, that's going to be such a foundation for anything that you're doing. Like, how's this working? What's going? What should we do next? If people are afraid to speak up, we're not, they're not going to feel hurt, right? They might feel like they don't matter. And then the appreciation to constantly reinforce that you are valued, you are important. And that can also help build trust and, and openness. I'm trying to think in terms of the aha moments. Certainly one of them is this notion of it's my boat and I get to decide. Um, it's, it's, it, to me, it's amazing how, how, many, how many people that's an aha moment, that they actually get to make choices in their life. Uh, not everything that they do is driven by, by obligation. And um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like what, what Christopher Avery is talking about with the responsibility principle. It actually enables people to, to take responsibility. Um, and, and that taking responsibility is hugely empowering. Okay. Um, I think another thing is, you know, what do I say yes to and what do I say no to? Okay. The, the notion that, oh yeah, I actually do have too much to do and I can't possibly do everything. Um, and that you can start to feel a little bit better about, um, you know, not getting everything done that you, that you thought you were going to do or everything takes longer than, than you think it's going to do. Um, and I think another thing that, that people appreciate when, when they do personal agility is this notion of celebrate. Celebrate and choose your life, okay? And this gets back to empowerment and it gets back to this mindset. And, you know, it's so easy to look at all the things that we didn't do. Uh, I just read a statistic somewhere. I, I would like to be able to quote the source, but I don't have it handy. Uh, this is something I read. They said uh, something like 40 or 60% of all items on a to-do list never actually get done. So it's a huge percent. Let's just call it in round numbers, roughly half. Okay. Ha yeah. So, you know, if, if such a huge percentage of your to dos aren't going to get done, that's not something about you. That's just, well, hey, it's easy to come up with ideas and it's harder to do things. It, it, takes, it takes more time. Um, and, and so, this whole thing about being intentional about what you're going to do, you know, and so a lot of people are finding that, you know, by having this context of what really matters, it also enables them to have a backbone. It enables them to say yes to this and no to that, okay, and be able to justify their decision. And you know, there are a lot of people in what I'll call complex family situations. Uh, you know, we've had people who've basically been able to throw off toxic relationships, you know, because of the, this this clarity of purpose, uh, or find find and establish their place in the family in a family that otherwise wasn't taking them seriously. Um, so I, I think I've used up three, um, but it, but if but if you'll give me a fourth one. One of the things that I'm hearing is that a lot of women see, you know, personal agility is really, really helpful in their lives. Um, you know, because, um, you know, I mean, everybody has these problems, but I think women more than men are confronted with the, you know, well, yes, I've got my job, but I've also got my husband, I've got my kids, um, I've got my parents, I've got my extended family, I've got all these expectations on me. Uh, and, oh, what about me? Oh, wait a minute. Hey, it's my boat. I get to make decisions. Um, and, and, you know, this, this, this you know, allows you to, to create some perspective about kind of where you are and what you want to be doing and, you know, you know, what you don't want to be doing. And so how do you spend more time doing the things that you want to be doing? So we've talked about a lot of stuff here. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, under the umbrella of how family agility helps when you've got too much to do and not enough time to do it, is there anything within this that you both feel like we've missed that we should cover that we should mention before we move on to another topic today so if i were to think of one thing to emphasize it would be the power of the pause and i think too often we don't take the time to stop and pause and take that step back to like the view of the forest versus the view in the trees right like are we in and I like to think about this, like your, your view in like video games. I, I don't know how many uh, video game players we have here in the audience, but you know, if you have like different views, you have like the first player view where you're looking outward, right? And then you have the view where you're looking from behind you and you can see you in the scene and what you're doing. And so it's like, our, we're often in that first player, first person mode where we're just looking outward. And then it's like, hey, can we step back and see ourselves in the scene? And if we can take that moment to pause, 
that's going to be what's going to make all the difference for us to, to stop and reflect on where are we in our life and are we getting the outcomes we want. And then in addition to that, I think there's a strong emphasis on, I want people to know that you matter and it's not selfish to take care of you first if you can be at your best to then be there for your family. And I think too often, and this could be something that, that um, it just becomes a default as like as a parent maybe, right? To put your kids first before you. But I know someone who was helping her grown kids in their 30s with money, with, with giving them rides because they, their car broke, like they, they never really got it fixed or they, and it's like, the more that you continue to do that, the more that they're going to just let you do that. And so not having any boundaries, it's not really helping people be self-sustainable. It's more of a crutch. And so what's interesting is one of the people that, that has been through the personal agility system, um, she started finally telling her kids, no, no, I cannot do everything for you. You're going to have to figure out how to do that for yourself. And now what's happened is not only has she been a better role model for them because she's intentional about her life, but now her kids are taking more responsibility. They're better off because she's not crutching them at every, every corner, every turn. And so I'm sure there's a delicate balance in there, or there's, you know, there's that longing to just be there for your, your children. But, you know, when you look at how can I be at my best and it's okay. I want people to know it's okay to put yourself first, to be at your best for other people, because otherwise you're running on fumes and that's when, you know, you get frustrated or you say things you didn't mean, or you get, you know, it's that one thing that tips you over the edge and you like lose your temper. And it, it's like, well, but you're the one who chose to do that. So can you choose differently? And the answer is yes. Right, right. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, as a parent, anything to add to that idea? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I was looking through the, you know, the questions and saying, you know, what, what have we missed? And, you know, what, what are the things that, that we haven't really talked about are risks and side effects or how can it go wrong? Yeah. Uh, you know, if you do, if you do agility. Um, I, I, I was thinking back to a time my kids were, I think, first grade and well, we do two years of kindergarten in Switzerland. So the younger was in the first year of kindergarten and the, and the, the older was in, was in first grade. And we were having real challenges, you know, with them, you know, getting them ready for school in the morning. Okay. And so one day we had this brilliant idea, let's use a task board. Okay. And so we asked the kids, you know, to make cards Said, well, what do you have to do to get ready for school? Okay. You know, and it was things like, you know, get dressed, brush your teeth. Um, um, I don't know, have breakfast, um, you know, like three or four, four, three, four, maybe five things that they had to do. We made these nice task boards. They had these cards, they could move them from waiting to working to done. And um, it worked, you know, at first it worked really well. Okay, so, okay, so what are you gonna do first? Oh, I'm gonna go get dressed. Okay, what are you gonna do next? You know, move it to done, celebrate, okay. Okay, what are you gonna do next? Oh, now I'm gonna go have breakfast, go have breakfast. Okay, what are you gonna do next? Um, I'm gonna go brush my teeth. Sun goes off, comes right back, dad, I can't brush my teeth. Oh, why not? Well, there's no toothpaste. Ah, impediment. Scrum master daddy fixes. And that worked wonderfully, okay? For about two or three days. But what happened is after two or three days, my kids figured this out and we figured it out. And all of a sudden, um, for some reason, my wife and I, we weren't as interested as using the task board. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, you've got to just move the cards by yourself. And the moment that we lost interest in it, our kids lost interest in it. And I think I've ruined them on post-its, you know, and, and task boards for the next 20 years because it's been, you know, th there was just somehow this message of it's, it's gotten boring. And so, you know, it's also possible, like, you know, when you do a family retrospective and really talk about what happened, it's very, especially if you've got small kids, it's very easy for that to degenerate in a, you know, the parents are complaining about the kids. Um, you know, and when you do that, of course, you, know, you break a lot of other things that, that, you know, we expect to have happen in, in an agile framework. So it's really, I mean, being a parent is tough, you know, but if you're trying to apply these agile practices with your kids, you really got to, you know, I don't know, I, I think you need to have a long, a long thought about how are we really going to do this and how are we going to make sure that, you know, we don't fall into patterns that might not be constructive. Um, you know, and as I say, the scrum master turning into dad, turning into a manager, turning into a micromanager, turning into a complaining micromanager, I mean, I'll, you know, you know, <laughs> we laugh, but the true story. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think, um, you know, how, how would I take it, you know, think through how it's supposed to work with, with um, you know, if you were doing this in an agile team framework, what would you want to have happen? Um, 
you know, how is that, you know, and then think, think through the same thing in your family. How would you like that to happen? You know, and maybe give some thought to what could go wrong and, you know, how do, how do we prevent kind of these, these, these um, how should I say, counterproductive patterns from occurring? Yep, that's fantastic. Anything else? I think just really want to leave people with the idea that when you, when you are clear on what really matters, when you are intentional about that, you can have more control or intent in the, the outcomes that you have in your life than you might realize, right? A lot of times we might feel like we're very reactive. And I mean, my goodness, busy, 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 meeting, the meeting, the meeting, the phone call, they're running this errand to, like, when do I have time to do anything? And you actually can, you can flip that and you can be more in control and more, more intentional about the outcomes in your life. And it just takes taking that first step to do it. And even with Agile and applied to anything, you don't have to know everything. You just need to be able to take the first step. And then you, you pivot, you inspect and adapt, you adjust as needed. And that's what Agile is. So there's really nothing standing in your way from starting to think differently and act differently today. It's just taking that moment to pause. And when you do, and when you prioritize yourself, you may be surprised at what those outcomes start to be. And it starts to be more in alignment with the, the things that you have. Like you can, uh, you can choose to you know, do things simple. You can, you can do, choose to have things good or choose to have things bad. What if it's something super chill and relaxed? And it's like, wow, I can choose that. I can choose to work outside rather than inside, right? And so I think there's a lot about us realizing we are the captain of our ship. We can figure out where we steer. And, you know, I even like to pull, a, a, you know, if you even think about like the whole movie concept, like you are not just the actor in your life, you are the director, you can write the script. And I think people don't realize that or we forget it. Like this is your life and you can choose. And that's what we are just very passionate about is empowering people to have that realization and then provide them with a simple framework on how to do it through the personal agility system. We've spoken a lot about it and not spoken about how to do it. How do you, how do you find your vision? What questions do you ask? How do you find your clarity of purpose? Yeah, okay, well, that's exactly what we put together in the personal agility system. And so we've got more resources at personalagilityinstitute.org. And we have put together this framework to walk people through exactly how to do that. And so it's a multifaceted step that we might not have time to get into fully today, but really it starts with asking the powerful question, what really matters? And then starting to visualize and look at, okay, what have I been doing breadcrumb trail? And then is that in alignment? Yes, no. And then, okay, do I want to choose differently? So it's, it's really creating that space to have that moment for um, reflection. And so that's what we walk people through exactly how to do that. And we have powerful coaching questions that we share with people on how you can really ask meaningful questions that can help you get that clarity. That's fantastic. And a great place to stop, Peter, if you're amenable to it as well. Okay. Yep. I'm good.